and I'll turn it right over to you. Okay. Okay, for everybody on the line, uh, we're going to get started here. We have a great presentation for you. I'm going to do a brief introduction, and then I'm going to turn it over to today's presenter, Tom Bowler. Good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar, Playground Safety, Investigation Perspectives from an Expert Witness. During this one-hour interactive event, our presenter will discuss the top playground liability issues that lead to injuries, the standard of care within the playground industry, and topics such as surfacing, supervision, border fencing, S-hooks, and head entrapment. Today's presenter is Tom Baller. Tom is an expert witness for attorneys throughout the United States. He consults on litigation matters involving playground equipment, playground supervision, physical education, athletics, and recreation. Over the past 18 years, Tom has consulted on 285 cases for both plaintiff and defense attorneys. He has presented nationally on topics of playground safety. Tom received his BS degree in physical education from the University of Connecticut in 1966. In 1973, he earned his Master's of Education from Springfield College. And in 1981, Tom received his Certificate of Advanced Graduate Studies from the University of Connecticut. He is a certified playground safety inspector. Tom has extensive experience inspecting playgrounds and handling litigation cases involving playground in injuries for both plaintiff and defense attorneys. His experience ranges from simple fracture cases to death cases. If you have a question during today's presentation, please use the Q&A feature or the chat feature, which are found on the right-hand side of the screen. Tom will do his best to answer your questions during the two Q&A sessions that will occur during the presentation of content. Approximately one hour after the event, we'll send out an email with a link to the archived recording of this webinar. We'll include the PowerPoint that was used during the event. Uh, we do ask that you take time to fill out the survey that will appear on your screen after the webinar is over. With that, I'm now going to turn it over to our distinguished presenter, uh, Mr. Tom Bowler. Tom, it is all yours. Uh, thank you, Matt. Thanks for that glowing introduction. Uh, certainly, I appreciate it, and I hope to live up to the expectations of the audience today. Uh, hello, everyone. I can't uh, see you physically, but uh, certainly, uh, hopefully, everyone can hear me. I'd just like to spend a minute on the title uh, of what consists of a CPSI, or a Certified Playground Safety Inspector. And that's who you should be hiring for your defending cases or your, for your plaintiff cases. Uh, certainly, you do not want someone that is uh, anything less than that. That's probably one of the premier certifications in the country right now for the knowledge of playground safety. It is credentialed by the National Recreation and Park Association, and they developed a National Playground Safety Institute back in Baltimore in 1991 was the first one. And since then, several thousands of people have been uh, certified throughout the country. So when you're searching out uh, an expert for a case, you certainly should seek out from the National Recreation and Park Association a certified playground safety inspector. And the purpose of that institute was to have individuals become more knowledgeable in the field of playground safety and to provide for safe playground environments. It's basically a two-day course, and on the third day, you can elect to take an optional examination of 100 questions, multiple choice, and you have to pass with a proficiency of 70%. And one needs to understand the Consumer Product Safety Commission's guidelines as well as the voluntary standard in playground safety developed by the American Society for Testing and Materials International out of West Conchacock and PA. Uh, upon passing the examination, one is qualified to inspect playgrounds uh, and render professional judgments as far as the safety of those pieces of equipment. Uh, so certainly, as I said, you should seek out a CPSI. You should also, when you're interviewing an expert for your case, you should ask for their current certification number and ask when the last time they were certified as a professional. It's uh, renewable every three years. I just received my renewable certification in Melbourne, uh, Florida about a week or two ago. Uh, with that, we'd like to focus on today's presentation and certainly within an hour's time, I can't explore every avenue of playground safety with you folks. 
Uh, but we're going to try to hit on six topics that I think are uh, certainly uh, going to be having a focal point for you and for me. Uh, number one, surfacing material is critical for safety on a playground. Equipment must be age appropriate, number two. Number three, supervision is implicated in many lawsuits. Number four, the standard of care within the playground industry comes from the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission and the American Society for Testing and Materials International. So those are the two groups really that uh, we're going to be focusing in on today and talking a little bit about today. Uh, we're going to talk about some special concerns with playgrounds in number five. And the special concerns that we'll cover in today's session will namely be the CCA wood issue or pressure treated wood issue, entrapment issues, the head, crush points, ad hooks and clevis attachments for swings, and directionality in investigating an incident. So those are special concerns with investigating a playground case. And then to sum it up, uh, we're going to have some investigative perspectives. Uh, I will sum up for the attorneys listening that can assist the recreational expert in litigation cases. Uh, certainly dealing with uh, many cases, uh, I feel I have a handle on uh, certain things that can help the attorney out there considering hiring an expert for the very first time or considering hiring a recreational expert for the very first time. So we're going to cover some of those things uh, in the last part of the session. For a little background, playground injuries are common. Playground injuries that require emergency room treatment occur every two and a half minutes within the United States. And I'm not talking about a hangnail. I'm not talking about a scraped elbow or scraped knee. I'm talking about something that would require emergency room treatment, such as head trauma, fractured arm, fractured leg. Uh, certainly, uh, it's occurring in the United States with great frequency, and we should be aware of that. Number two, playground injuries occur at public parks, public and private schools, daycare centers, apartment buildings, and fast food restaurants. Uh, obviously, backyards and homes, obviously people have playground equipment, but the focus of this presentation is not on backyard facilities. And certainly I can attest that uh, in the last uh, several years, 17 years thereabouts, I've only had about two cases in the backyard of the parents doing another parent. So it's not frequent that you get a home backyard uh, litigation suits, more frequent uh, in apartment buildings, daycare centers, private schools, public uh, venues, and fast food restaurants. That's where you're going to get most of your litigation cases. So we're not focusing on the home, but I want to recognize that injuries do occur in the backyards as well. Uh, CPSC, the Consumer Product Safety Commission, estimates there are more than 156,000 injuries each year on public use playgrounds. Uh, and certainly when we take into all count of all types of playgrounds, homes, restaurants, et cetera, uh, we're looking probably on any given year about a quarter of a million children getting injured. There's probably another quarter of a million children that are getting injured that go unreported. Uh, so we should be aware of the, the injury factor here. Uh, just as, a, again, a little background of where does these, where do the statistics come from for injury data? Uh, it comes from the NEST. System, the National Electronic Injury Surveillance System, which is a very valuable tool. Um, basically, it doesn't limit itself just to playground injuries per se, but if you're seeking out a football injury, a soccer injury, or any kind of recreational injury, you can go to them and ask them to do a search for you, and they will uh, give you a search based on uh, 100 sample hospitals throughout the United States of various sizes. Uh, and the emergency rooms that the hospitals do represent would have to have more than uh, six beds. And uh, basically, the data is collected, it's coded, and it's coded by triage, triage date, the age of the victim, the sex, the type of injury, the body part, and then they have a brief comment usually of what happened at the injury, uh, what the child or the adult was doing. Uh, and this is all coded into the information, so it's standardized. Uh, the various hospitals do carry various weights, so it's representative throughout the United States of uh, the hospitals, so they can uh, give you statistics on this. And uh, the CPSC uses the data for injury reports. That's a quick and dirty look at uh, what NESS is, and uh, certainly uh, you should be aware of that system. You should be aware of it when you're doing some research for 
your cases on injury cases, not just playground cases, but uh, all cases, you can go to them and get a feel for how many injuries are happening around the country. There's many types of injuries, obviously, in the playgrounds, and uh, certainly uh, the most common would be fractures of the arms and legs. Uh, we do have some serious injuries involving, involving the head and striking the surface or other pieces of equipment, but uh, by and large, the most common injury that I get in a litigation suit would be a fracture of the arm. Uh, deaths can be associated with playground equipment as well. Uh, certainly, uh, strangulation. I haven't had a strangulation case. However, that uh, is something that can occur. Uh, the two death cases that I did have, one was in Ohio, which we'll talk about a little bit later in the presentation, and one was in the state of Connecticut. Uh, and we'll talk about the Ohio case, as I said, in just a moment. This death case involves some border or privacy fencing. The fact pattern involves the typical stockade privacy fencing you would find around a home or an apartment complex. This happened to be around an apartment complex. Some slats of the five-quarter stock wood were missing, which allowed a gap of about two and a half feet for someone to slip through. Uh, obviously, maintenance was an issue in this case, so maintenance was implicated in this case, and we found that in the testimony of individuals that they indicated that this was a type of situation that existed for uh, several months. It wasn't just something that happened uh, the day before the incident happened. The existing condition existed previously, although they had notice. A uh, three-year-old boy, unfortunately, climbed through the flat. We didn't quite know why he went through. There was a rumor that there was a toy cell phone that he was trying to retrieve. And in Columbus, Ohio, uh, instead of calling it a hit-and-run driver, they called it a hit-and-skip driver. That was the terminology. Uh, so there was a maintenance issue. There was also a supervision issue as well in this particular case. I operate as a plaintiff expert witness in this case, but there was also a supervision issue that was raised by the defendant party of where the parents were and when were the parents out there and so forth uh, because the child had slipped out the back door. It was a warm spring day in April, about three years ago to the date almost, and uh, he came in off the concrete uh, patio of the apartment complex seeking a drink of water on a warm day and basically slipped outside again. The father was going to meet him at the playground and before uh, he could ask him to wait, the child went to the playground, slipped out the fence, and he was hit by a car. The standards that I'm referencing in this case would be uh, ASTM F2049, which is a fencing standard, and, and basically this is a standard safety performance specification for fences, barriers for public, commercial, and multifamily residential use outdoor play areas. That's a mouthful. But uh, basically, it is a fence standard that uh, applies to playgrounds and playgrounds that are vulnerable to uh, traffic, uh, railroad tracks, bodies of water, streets, parking lots, roads, the electrical and other utility features must have a fence around it. It's as simple as that. Uh, the housing code could be cited in this case. In this particular case, uh, it was actually the Columbus Safety Code, which indicated that all fences and gates should be maintained in good condition. So we were relying, at least I was relying, on those two standards in the field uh, and uh, basically in my testimony. I was opposed in the case, but the case never went to trial. It was settled before trial. This is the actual photograph of uh, one of the shots when I flew out to Columbus and on a very, very humid day in August, uh, took this picture. You can see to the right, uh, you will see a cone sitting on top of the fence. Those were a couple of the flats that were repaired in the fence that the boy slipped through. The number nine lying on its side, the ID marker nine lying on its side, represents the approximate point somewhere in that vicinity where the boy was struck. And the tape laying down to the telephone pole in the far background represents how far the boy was thrown when he was hit, which represents 50 feet. A uh, tragic case, and uh, this particular road was posted at 25 miles per hour. They never did find the driver of the vehicle. Here we have uh, a situation of looking inside the apartment complex and the fencing, looking toward the uh, bag of tools where is the approximate spot where the child got hit, uh, and was slipped through. Obviously, they repaired the flats uh, by that point in time. A few months after I arrived, the boy was hit in April of 2007. I arrived in August of 2007. 
The fence was replaced at that time. It was 50 feet, six inches away from the nearest swing. So in close proximity to the road, obviously, and you can see in the background there was a factory, it was sort of an industrial type of area, HUD housing, uh, and certainly a large, large complex. Other types of issues on playgrounds, uh, not to drift away too far from playground equipment, would be softball backstops, and sometimes fencing can create uh, dangerous situations there. This is actually an elementary uh, backstop at a school, and uh, you can see that this can be quite hazardous as the uh, tines are not knuckled down, and we have uh, the wire being looped back up onto the cross-member uh, pipe to hold it in place, and uh, in this particular situation, another injury uh, did occur uh, where the fact pattern in this particular elementary school backstop case was the child was actually climbing on the backstop at recess, and the child raked their hand across the top of the uh, tines as you saw them, and the fence salvage was not knuckled over as I indicated, and obviously you saw the fence in a state of disrepair, and the way we could probably avoid this would be obviously have new fencing, or what they're doing now on a lot of softball fields or baseball fields is providing a guard or a cap over the top. You might have seen some of these uh, bright yellow uh, types of plastic uh, piping over the top of uh, the fence, so we provide certainly safety for uh, people participating in those areas. Uh, in this particular case, in proper maintenance, obviously, and in proper supervision, uh, the caregiver, the care professional, or the teacher should have uh, obviously uh, asked the child to get down from the backstop and allowing the child to climb on the backstop. And I referenced here uh, basically ASTM uh, F2000, which is a standard guide for fences for ball fields and other sport facilities, and basically indicates in there that fences should be reasonably plumb and free from defects. So uh, ASDM is a good source to reference for cases, obviously uh, promulgating several, several standards in the area, which we'll talk about a little bit later in the presentation. Surfacing material is uh, extremely important on playgrounds. Uh, it is probably, if you had to replace one thing on a playground, an old decrepit playground, if you had to replace one thing, Perhaps the best thing to replace would be the surfacing material if that was deficient because certainly that will uh, cause many, many accidents uh, on, a, on a playground. Uh, surfacing materials for playgrounds must be able to absorb shock, and the benchmark in the industry is the head. We really don't have thresholds for fractured arms, fractured legs, collarbones, and so forth. Uh, the benchmark for the head is 200 Gs or less of force. Uh, anything beyond 200 Gs of force would more likely than not produce a serious head injury, if not a life-threatening injury. Uh, there's no one material that best fits all situations. Wood mulch is commonly used in many locales. However, it uh, certainly has some of its drawbacks because it has to be replenished and it rots and so forth. Uh, surfacing will vary in many parts of the country. Uh, Sand is prevalent in Florida, uh, where I have a condo with my wife, and they use sand there frequently because, obviously, sand is readily available in Florida. Uh, in other parts of the country, obviously, uh, sand uh, certainly wouldn't attest to the standard of F1951, which is the ASTM standard for accessibility for wheelchairs. So, uh, certainly, wood mulch has to um, attest to that as well. And, uh, you just can't get ground up trees off the highway department and put them in because you're going to be having poison ivy, poison oak, thorns, and so forth. And it should be really an engineered type of mulch that you're buying from a commercial company. Uh, the lack of depth of surfacing is an issue in many cases. Sometimes there's mulch there or sand there, whatever the case might be. However, there's, it's only an inch in depth, and it's not maintained. And the measurement must be temporarily linked to the incident. You all know that. Uh, I think you do, at least. Uh, but uh, obviously, to hire an expert and say the incident happened two or three years ago, would you go out there now, Tom, and measure the surfacing uh, certainly would not be admissible, as you know, in a court of law, because it's not temporarily linked to the, the incident at hand. Uh, I could go out there and see what it is at that point in time, but to temporarily link it, it's, it's difficult to do that. Uh, certainly... The quicker
quicker you can get to someone on the case, an expert, uh, the better off you are. If you wait, obviously the passage of time will change the circumstances. I can go out and estimate uh, the depth of equipment as long as I have photographs that were taken near the site uh, at the time of the injury. Uh, if someone got injured today, on April 29, 2010, and I went out within two months, things might change through erosion and so forth, but if I looked at the vertical piping on the playground and compared it with pictures you took and day after and then compared it with me going out uh, two months afterwards, I could probably make a reasonable judgment, uh, an estimate of how deep that mulch was if I have a guideline to go by. Many companies now are sometimes placing on a demarcation line on their poles to indicate where the mulch should be put up to a certain level. And going by that particular demarcation line, one can uh, look at that and see if it was deficient or not. So there are, there are some ways to get around the absolute necessity of going out the day after and taking your photographs and measurements, because that's not always possible, as we all know, in litigation cases. This is a uh, sample of the mulch, and basically, when you do take photographs, if you're doing it yourself or if you're sending out a private investigator, you should have two photographs. I only included one, but you really have, should have two photographs of your of your depth. You should have one taken from afar, showing the full view of where this hole is dug in relationship to the piece of equipment, so we have a perspective. And then you should have a tight view that I'm showing you here. This looks to be about eight inches uh, in depth, and which is a fairly good depth. Uh, certainly, it generally should be nine inches of compressed mulch uh, to live up to the standard of care within the industry. Um, basically, uh, CPSIs will not have, the Certified Playground Safety Inspector will not have the instrumentation to go out there and scientifically measure with any kind of a dropped head form uh, testing device to tell you exactly this is 210 Gs of force, it impacted the uh, wood chips with, et cetera. Uh, we simply don't have the instrumentation. To hire a laboratory such as Detroit Testing Labs to come out and do it can be a fairly expensive proposition. So the best a CPSI can do for you would be to go out and say it's eight inches, it's two inches, it's three inches, and more likely than not, uh, you know, this would have uh, supported uh, hopefully a fall. Uh, it's within the realm of uh, consistency if it was nine, nine inches. If it's one inch, it's more likely than not. It could have created this incident to occur. But again, you would have to get a biomechanical engineer involved other than a CPSI to really make a, a case stronger for yourself. Um, so the measuring is the best way we can go about doing this. The unitary material, talking about your uh, tiles that are uh, placed on top of uh, black pots sometimes. Sometimes they're glued down, depends on the uh, type of situation. Sometimes it's poured in place, and you've probably experienced that, that both if you have children going out to a playground, say at a McDonald's or a Burger King, where you walk upon this surfacing, it's very spongy. Uh, those surfaces, again, you can't really measure the depth. There's no way to measure the depth unless you get on the side of the uh, playground surfacing, you can measure the depth, whether it's two inches or whatever it might be. But again, you would have to get confirmation from the installer of actually does it live up to the uh, attenuation force of 200 Gs or less. Uh, again, a CPSI does not have the instrumentation to go out there and actually uh, give you that information of uh, you know how much force uh, a body did strike the, uh, the surfacing width. Um, Sample holes should be dug in at least six locations. Sometimes from attorneys I might get a, a shot like this, and it doesn't give me any reference point of where the shot was taken. Uh, it's only one shot taken, only one sample. When I go out, I'll do at least six probe holes in the vicinity of the incident. That gives me a flavor of five inches, nine inches, seven inches. Gives me a flavor of what is occurring. If uh, I want to get a real good sampling, I might go into several locations of the playground, not just the incident area, and uh, take it far and wide so I get a flavor of uh, how the mulch has been dispersed and so forth. So that gives me kind of a, a uh, flavor of what uh, is happening. What you'll find, and you'll see a garden trough to the 
right of that photograph, you'll find mulch as you dig down. If it's rotting, it gets to a black silt. And then eventually what you should hit with mulch, you should hit a what we call a geotextile fabric. It's a weed barrier. Once you hit that weed barrier, you know you can stop because that's the end of your uh, surfacing material. And whatever that distance is from a weed barrier up to the top of your mulch, that's the distance of uh, depth of your mulch uh, for, for surfacing. Below that, many times there's a stone layer, but you wouldn't be digging through or ripping the uh, geotextile fabric to find that out. Again, the standard care within the industry is nine inches of compressed mulch. Usually it's placed down about 12 inches with the traffic of children over it. It would compress to nine inches. Uh, you need very verification of the person who measures the hole for you. If you're having a private investigator going out, to make sure you have uh, verification of who measured the hole, what did he find in the hole, was it rotting away. Sometimes you can see layering, and that will give you an indication of when your uh, loads of uh, mulch were dropped. And many times uh, this is important. I'll ask attorneys for uh, invoices on mulch drops so we can tell when the last drop was placed in there. If it was several years ago, Obviously, we know it's not, they're not maintaining their playground. Uh, but sometimes you'll ask, actually see the new mulch layer and then a darker layer and then a darker layer below that. So we, it's layering so we know when the mulch was dropped and it's rotting away. Uh, so that's something to look forward to, you know, ask your private investigator to look uh, out for us because uh, the layering is a, a very critical type of thing. Okay, playground equipment must be age appropriate. Uh, playground equipment is broken down into ages six months, believe it or not, through 23 months of age, ages two through five, and ages five through 12. And there is an overlap in the age five category um, because basically in some instances a child that is five uh, will act more like a preschooler than as an elementary child age five. So that's why there's an overlap there because of the developmental stage of that child. Uh, basically, the new Consumer Product Safety Commission booklet is available online. It's the Public Playground Safety Handbook, and uh, you can get that in PDF form online. And that age range is from six months to 12 years of age. Uh, there's actually a standard by STM International for six months through 23 months of age, believe it or not. Uh, Certainly the ages on a playground should be posted. Many times they're not posted, and that gives direction to the caregiver, the parent, and so forth. So one of the things that I look for in my investigations would be are the ages posted. And all the equipment is not meant for all the players. Certainly if we have equipment out there, it doesn't mean that all the children in that age range should be using all of that equipment. So that's something to take into consideration. Here's a typical sign you might see at a playground. Uh, Certainly the ages are represented here. They have uh, a ruling about uh, when it can be used. Uh, it uh, closes down at dusk to dawn. They have rules of the playground. And the only criticism I guess I would have of this particular sign, everything is stated in the negative. It's not stated very positively. Do not, do not, do not, and so forth. Uh, and I would try to you know, rephrase that to put it more in the positive. Uh, vernacular because certainly we don't want to be negative on a playground. And about five to six rules are basically all what a child can really handle at one time. So you don't want to list a laundry list of dozens and dozens of rules on a playground because they're not going to read them anyway. And if the font is too small, people are not going to read them. So the best spot for this signage would be at the egress point of the playground. And if any point is coming in naturally by a fence or a gate, that would be the most opportune place to to place this particular sign. Supervision is implicated in many lawsuits. I'm sure you're aware of that, those of you who have had uh, playground or supervision cases. And there's really no magical ratio for playground supervision. Uh, some states within their daycare systems will mandate ratios. For example, I just uh, completed a case in Philadelphia uh, in a daycare uh, situation where uh, Pennsylvania law, as you probably know, statute, it indicates to one to ten ratio, one adult to ten children. If it's beyond that, obviously, you're out of compliance. And that's what happened in this particular case. Uh, the uh, caregiver was left alone, and she had all the children, and it's somewhere in the vicinity of 11, 12 children. So they were out of compliance at that point in time, and their staff handbook indicated one to ten, as well as 
Pennsylvania statute. So uh, it was, for me, it was an, an easy case in citing those uh, particular uh, mandates. Uh, the National Program for Playground Safety, which is located at the University of Northern Iowa, would indicate whatever the student-teacher ratio is inside the classroom, uh, it should be the same outside. So if you have a 1 to 20 ratio, that should be basically the ratio outside. Being a teacher for 33 years, retired in 1999, I can attest that that's not always practical, particularly in today's economy with budgets and so forth. Uh, you're just not going to get that magical ratio of 1 to the ratio that's inside the classroom. It just doesn't work that way, unfortunately, outside the classroom. And case law, as you're probably aware on this issue, is anywhere widespread 1 to 40 to 1 to 90. Uh, and we have to take into account special needs youngsters. Uh, if a child uh, needs special attention on the playground, is physically handicapped, mentally challenged, uh, autistic, whatever that uh, uh, handicapping situation might be, disabling condition might be, obviously we have to take this into concern as, as well as far as how one has to supervise because you might need one adult one-on-one -on, -one on this particular child. Uh, certainly I don't want to, uh, before we get into a couple of questions here, I don't want to deflect the whole concept of bullying. Bullying has been in the news with cyberbullying, and certainly as bullying can be rampant on playgrounds, rampant in schools, and certainly I believe in the state of Pennsylvania, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, Act 61 was signed into law on July 9th of 2008, and Act 61 requires a mandatory bullying policy in each Pennsylvania school. Uh, so each school district would have to have their own bullying uh, types of uh, policies. I know Connecticut changed their definition of bullying uh, in their statutes uh, a couple of years ago where they had to have repeated acts by the same individual. Uh, they recently changed that within the last year or two to just one act. One singular act can constitute a bullying act. I'm dealing with an attorney in the state of Maine and on a physical education matter and uh, that state has no bullying law. So it, it, it varies throughout the country. Uh, I believe we're going to stop here now, and that's going to take over for if anyone has questions out there. Yes, we do. Thank you, Tom. Uh, we do have a couple questions in the queue here. Um, Gregory asks, how do you deal with a negligent case, design case? What can the attorney do to help the expert in a negligent design case as opposed to a negligent maintenance case? Okay, good question. Very good question. Uh, design you know, cases are, are going to be tough because we have to look toward the Consumer Product Safety Commission, ASTM. Uh, there is a third-party endorser, which I have on a later slide, which is IPEMA, the International Play Equipment Manufacturers Association, and they have a website, IPEMA. And basically, uh, we would have to look if that piece of equipment has been endorsed by that particular group because they're the third-party endorser and they will attest if the product lives up to the certification of ASTM, the ASTM guideline 1487-07 uh, is the latest, latest revision. That's the public uh, playground standard. So it's, it's rather difficult when you get into uh, design cases, uh, certainly. Uh, some are easy. Some are easy if uh, Certainly, if it was designed, and let's suppose the slide was uh, uh, two feet off the ground when the, the youngster exits, well, that, that's easy because certainly it clearly indicates uh, in the specifications that a slide should be no uh, longer, larger than 7 to 15 inches. So uh, sometimes you can quote the standards readily. Sometimes uh, you have to go to ITEMA to see if this product was indeed endorsed by them, and then you are fighting basically uh, an industry standard if you, you buck uh, going against IPEMA. And uh, certainly, you know, they do make mistakes, and certainly they're not infallible. But uh, certainly uh, product liability kinds of situations with playgrounds are a more difficult type of case than the simple maintenance case. Uh, to piggyback on that, Tom, actually, we have a, a question from Chris, Chris about slides. Um, are there standards on how far off the ground the slide must be at its termination? Uh, yes, uh, any slide uh, basically over four feet in height would have to be between seven to 15 inches off the uh, surfacing grade. Okay, great. We have a question here from Car Carol who asks, do sports fields and recreation fields fall under the same guidelines as playgrounds? 
no, no. Uh, if you're talking generally about uh, uh, sports and uh, uh, you're talking about recreational fencing and so forth, there are separate ASTM standards for uh, sports and uh, uh, fencing, and there's obviously a separate standard for uh, public playgrounds. Uh, so basically, ASTM has a wide range of standards, and uh, they have everything under the sun, and I might cover that a little bit later in the presentation, but uh, uh, no, it's not just under one umbrella. There's separate standards for sports, various sports, various, obviously, regulation bodies, uh, regulatory bodies, such as uh, the National Federation uh, of High School Sports uh, does regulate the various individual uh, state associations regulate high school sports, so it's not just uh, one, one umbrella. I hope I answered that sufficiently for the uh, person making the question. Excellent. And um, at the beginning of the presentation, Tom, you said that the most um, common injury that you saw was a fractured arm. Um, have you seen any trends that have developed over the past couple of years where there have been injuries that you've seen in greater frequency that you weren't used to seeing in the past? I think the fractured arm probably was the most common that I see. I see uh, quite a few. It seems to run in cycles uh, over uh, head ladders. Uh, seem to be one of the most common kinds of injuries, and it's a variety of either triangular loop ladders or straight overhead ladders, but that's one of the most common injuries that I find. A child is not strong enough, or they slip off the rung, or the ladder has been placed too high off the surfacing material, and they fall and break an arm. Uh, and I, I seem to see a lot of those kinds of uh, litigation issues of the overhead variety. Uh, other than the fractured arm, I haven't seen... Uh, uh, any kinds of uh, recent things that come to mind quickly uh, as far as litigation goes. But the overhead uh, arm head injuries are the uh, uh, most common. Okay. We have uh, probably one final question for this Q&A session. We'll be having a Q&A session here um, in a couple more slides. So if you have some questions that come to mind, please submit them. But Barbara asks, are there any standards that address how long a period of time, a component part that is used in a playground equipment should be should last from the time it's manufactured to the time of installation. Uh, no, there's no uh, regulation on that. Certainly, uh, one has to uh, keep an eye out for uh, rusting and corrosion, which we'll get into in a little bit. Uh, but there's no uh, specification on how long it has to be out there. Certainly, anything that's uh, prior to 1981. Uh, one, uh, certainly should be removed from the playground because more likely than not, they don't have any compliance with any standard in the field. The first uh, Consumer Product uh, Safety Commission booklet was uh, printed in 1981, and if anything was installed prior to that, it's probably out of compliance and should be taken out. But as far as your direct question goes, no, there's no specific duration of time when a component has to be taken out, and uh, there's no longevity for one, for one particular piece. I would just say, generally speaking, a playground piece of equipment probably wouldn't last more than 10 years. When you get beyond 10 years, you're pushing it a bit. But again, that's uh, dependent on ultraviolet rays. It depends on how much it's used. It depends on how well it's maintained. And there's uh, a multitude of factors that go into that. Okay, great. I don't see any other questions in the queue. So why don't we continue, it, continue on with the presentation of content? Okay, the uh, standards that we've been talking about, uh, specifically around the screen right now, the standards up here, these are the two uh, documents that uh, one would be uh, quoting in a litigation matter, whether it be defendant or uh, plaintiff. And uh, these are the two standards that uh, basically are cited uh, more often than not. Uh, the first, basically, the Standard Consumer Safety Performance Specification for Playground Equipment for Public Use, F1487. 0707 being the last year of publication, uh, would be uh, developed by ASTM, and uh, certainly it's very technical in nature. It's a voluntary standard. Uh, you don't have to follow it if you don't want to. Uh, obviously, it's voluntary. Uh, the Consumer Product Safety Commission's handbook, the uh, Public Playground Safety Handbook, was printed in April of 2008, two years ago, and that's available uh, in PDF format, as I said, on the CCSC website. You can download that and read that uh, that is for free. Unfortunately, ASTM is not for free. That's, you have to pay for, unfortunately. And uh, uh, certainly uh, the guideline, it's a guideline by the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission. And many times I'm asked in deposition, well, Mr. Bowler, 
uh, if it's a plaintiff case. Uh, these are not mandatory. These are not uh, state laws. These are not federal laws. Do we have to follow them? And one, the ASTM is a voluntary standard. The other is a guideline. And basically, my retort would be, if you're not following these, what are you following for playground safety? So the, this, this represents the standard here with the industry. Is it law? No. But certainly, there are documents that people turn to for developing the standard of care. Uh, other standards developed by ASTM would be high chairs, toy safety, uh, baby cribs, beanbag chairs, fire safety for candles, shopping carts. There's a multitude of standards out there. So if you're not familiar with ASTM, I know many attorneys uh, are not knowledgeable about ASTM, don't know about ASTM. I'm sure many of you do uh, know about it, but many people do not know about it. Uh, I know colleges, when I ask the question, when I go to lecture sometimes, the students are not taught about ASTM, and they don't even know what I'm talking about. So it's something to know the existence of because they're very useful in litigation matters when you know there's a standard out there you can point to. Uh, various agencies do promote playground safety. The most prominent agencies would be the National Recreation and Park Association. IPEMA, we just mentioned a little while ago in the question that they dealt with uh, a product uh, liability case. Uh, they would be the third-party endorser, and they would be uh, approving a piece of equipment. You can go on their site. They have a site. You just Google IPEMA, and you could go on that site and pull up any kind of uh, Playground manufacturer, landscape structures, Miracle Recreation and Equipment Company, uh, Game Time, any manufacturer, Google their site and uh, go to that direct uh, site for Game Time, for example, using that as an example, and put in uh, various slides, and they will tell you all the slides that they have approved on that particular product. So it's a very useful website. The National Program for Playground Safety, I've mentioned already, is another certification that I do have. It involves the component of supervision. The Consumer Federation of America, CFA, has not done much with playground safety lately, but they did develop about five national surveys, the last one being in 2002, uh, which uh, shows the state of affairs in a particular state. Unfortunately, their sampling was not uh, very well done sometimes. So if they did 12 playgrounds in one state. They might have indicated that was the state of affairs for that particular state. And, of course, we know that that's not a very good sampling uh, uh, survey. Um, Supervision, uh, we need an adequate number of supervisors, two as a minimum for any kind of uh, endeavor out on the playground because if one child gets hurt, you have to obviously bring that child indoors and at least you're left with one outdoors. If you're out there with one to 40 children, if someone does get hurt, what do you do now? So two would be my advice for a minimum type of coverage for supervision. You need to develop adequate sight lines. You need to roam within the space. You need to cover a zone if sight lines are blocked. I was recently, about two weeks ago, in Sarasota, Florida, and I was looking at a site, and it was a very long site with a fence on one side of the playground and a building on the other, very long and narrow, 400 feet, in fact, uh, the length of an outfield uh, fence in baseball. That's how deep it was. And the, as you can realize, being long and narrow, all the playground pieces were in a row, so you couldn't see much beyond the fourth or fifth piece without having your sight lines blocked by pieces that were in the way. So I advise the attorney, the defendant attorney in this case, how they can get around that would be to uh, cover a zone and zone it off so you're only covering certain pieces, not letting the children roam for the whole length because the teacher couldn't possibly see from one end to the other. So just cover a zone. If the teachers broke themselves up into a zone, it would work out uh, very nicely. Need to pay close attention to non-compliant children. More likely than not, I find in many instances, not always, but many instances, the non-compliant children are getting hurt more often. Uh, the children didn't pay attention. They're doing poorly in school. Uh, they're ADHD or ADD uh, type of children. So uh, this is something to look at. Uh, need to pay close attention to climbing apparatus. Uh, this is where most of your injuries will occur, in your overhead ladders, as we said a little while ago. So we have to pay close attention to this equipment. And this is a hot bed for litigation, your climbing apparatus. Uh, you need to have a communication system on the playground, such as a two-way walkie-talkie system, and you need to have an emergency action plan. More often than not, I see in litigation matters, a child gets hurt, and immediately the caregiver, thinking that they're doing the best thing will pick up the child and carry him into the nurse's office. And this is exactly what we don't want the child to do, uh, the adult to do, to move the child because we know that further injury can occur. 
was they think they're doing the good thing by just picking the child up and bringing them inside. And the child might have a fracture of a leg, a fracture of an arm, whatever. Uh, so this is something uh, that you have to be aware of, that many times caregivers do not know how to give emergency first aid. Uh, in this particular situation, we have sight lines here taken from the back from afar. You wouldn't be supervising this far back, but we can see the sight lines in this particular uh, playscape are, are occluded and blocked because you can't see through the playground. And certainly this is something you have to be aware of in wooden structures if your sight lines are blocked. You have to have enough supervisors to roam. You have to be out there uh, looking and uh, you have to be moving around constantly. Special concerns on a playground, the CCA wood, the chromated copper arsenate, which we are building decks with, the home decks many years ago, also playground equipment, is no longer used on playgrounds as of December 31, 2003. The concern was the arsenic contact in the wood and exposing children to the chemical on playgrounds. Um, and the Consumer Product Safety Commission suggests sealing the existing playgrounds that contain CCA wood with oil or water-based sealant to prevent the arsenic from leaching out. Uh, and uh, this is uh, something that uh, I think we're getting away from right now, hopefully uh, seeing uh, these are aging playgrounds are being taken out, and hopefully we're not seeing any longer the CCA type of playgrounds. I might also interject that creosote poles should not be used on playgrounds, along with creosote railroad types of ties for containment borders. So that's something that we should avoid using. The entrapment can lead to strangulation. The critical area to avoid would be the space of three and a half to nine inches on a playground. Any space within this range with opposing runs can entrap a child's head, and this can lead to uh, strangulation. And the most uh, children at risk of, uh, during, between the ages of two and five, that would be the ages that uh, would be most at risk within the strangulation area. Here you have a typical situation where you have a uh, platform and you have a barrier system of railing, but unfortunately the railing wasn't set at the proper depth. It should be closer to that uh, uh, deck system, and they left a little bit too much gap area. It doesn't have to be right down to the level of the deck, but you see the typical standard industry probes, the smaller probe representing a torso of a two-year-old five percentile child, and the larger probe representing the 95th percentile of a five-year-old's head. So if we assume that the child will slip through the feet, and the torso would definitely slip through, you can see the spacing there, the torso probe would definitely slip through that space, the child would be dangling from the head in that location and would strangle to death within a short amount of time. Again, the large probe represents the 95th percentile five-year-old's head, and the smaller probe represents the five percentile two-year-old's torso. So these are the probes I, you would use in a standard situation in measuring for such spaces, spaces, and I would indicate to an attorney through a letter and verbally if I found spaces because I feel morally and ethically obligated to point this out to any attorney when I find these types of spaces. In this particular playground, I found about five spaces, and I pointed them out to the attorney, and I put it in writing as, as well. Crush points is another special concern. Uh, crush points do exist between two opposing forces, and merry-ground steering wheels and roller slides can create such crush points for fingers and so forth and arms. So we have to be aware of crush points. This is an example of a crush point. We have a steering wheel on a toy type of car that you commonly will see on a playground, an abstract kind of car. And uh, you have two, two issues here, really. There's the torso probe going through, which wouldn't admit the head probe, so we have a strangulation situation going on there as well. But you also, where you see the uh, neck of the torso probe, you see a child's vision that to be an arm in there. If we turn the wheel around now, the child will get crushed the arm if another child is spinning the wheel. And the way to avoid that would be simply by having a solid wheel and not have spokes to a steering wheel, so we don't get any body parts in there. Uh, so that's the way we can avoid that particular scenario. Headsets are a common problem on playgrounds, and many times uh, litigation cases I have will implicate S hooks. Uh, they need to be pinched to four one hundredths of an inch, and that means nothing to a lot of you folks out there, but the thickness of a dime or a credit card, that's four one hundredths of an inch. So if you go on a playground and you don't have a, a gauge, a spark plug gauge to measure four one hundredths of an inch, simply take out your credit card and slide it through 
uh, the end of the loop of an S hook. If it passes through, you know that S hook has failed the test. So this is a good way of, of finding out. Uh, S hooks can entangle children's clothing. It's not just that they can come off the loop, but they can entangle children's clothing, and that can create a problem. I had a case in Florida a few years ago in the Miami area where a child was uh, jogging with his dad, and he was in probably pre-teens, early teens, and he went to get off the swing set, and he had some uh, loose spinning shorts on. They entangled his shorts, the S hooks. He fell backwards, and he received a lumbar spine injury. Uh, it was actually a defending case, and uh, I went there to measure the S hooks and so forth, and uh, uh, a few of them did fail, and uh, certainly S hooks will not stretch over a period of time. They should remain in a pretty crimp position. Uh, uh, certainly they can become dislodged if not uh, crimped sufficiently. Uh, here you see a typical way to measure S hooks. The, I'm measuring with a gauge the top loop, and you can see visually, if you all look at that visually, the bottom loop, where I'm not measuring, the, by the naked eye, you can see there's a great space uh, in that particular loop, and that also can catch clothing. So that would be very dangerous on a playground if something of that uh, loop did exist. The other top of the swing is also very critical with an S hook as well as the clevis. You can see the whole clevis here, which uh, attaches to the swing component the hanger, and that attaches to the S-hook itself, and I'm pushing the S-hook away to the left, and you can see if you look between the 1 and the 7th of ID number 17, the D at the bottom, that has worn away more than halfway the clevis. That should not be in that state of affairs, and you can see how much that has worn away, and we have to be uh, very, very cognizant of that, especially in uh, areas where there's salt air. Uh, this happened to be in Connecticut, where I'm doing an examination of a case. But I had a case uh, about a year ago in Florida, uh, just west of uh, Fort Lauderdale, and uh, there was a case down there where Salt Air had actually done a number on the clevis and the uh, young woman, it was a young woman at a birthday party at a, a public park, got on the swing, and it actually the clevis gave way, and she went flying through the air and suffered a severe uh, fracture. Um, so certainly in salt air locations, one has to be very cognizant of uh, metallics and so forth because this can eat away at uh, equipment. One of the special concerns, certainly uh, in any case, and I'm not just uh, limiting my remarks to playgrounds right now, but uh, uh, for any case, would be the directionality of where the incident took place. And I'm using a road traffic hazard triangle here to point out that this direction is pointing north in this particular case. Uh, and this is very fruitful in any case, any investigation. You might uh, ask if you'd like yourself to do this yourself or if you haven't been doing it uh, with a compass, simple boy style compass, or have your private investigator go out. But many times I find that in the literature that I'm getting in the depositions or the interrogatories, the request for production and so forth, uh, it never is it listed where north-south line is. And the directionality for all cases is important because when you get on the witness stand, you must talk in an intelligent manner and indicate where the north-south line would be. So that, that's key. It's one of the first things I do in an investigation, whether it be a soccer field, a football field, a basketball court, or a playground, to determine where is the north-south line. I think they're going to stop again for some questions at this point in time. Yes, we have a couple questions here in the queue, and if you have any other questions for uh, Tom, please use the Q&A or the chat feature, which is found on the right-hand side of the screen. Um, we have two questions from Jeffrey. The first one is, who decides the age appropriateness of the playground equipment? The manufacturer? What is the standard? Okay, the manufacturer would generally be deciding that, and uh, certainly it's scaled down usually for two through five, and the uh, decks uh, are much closer to the ground, the slides are uh, much closer to the ground, uh, the angles of such are not as severe, uh, so the manufacturer would be deciding in their catalogs this is appropriate for ages 2 through 5 and 5 through 12, so it's usually a manufacturer's type call, uh, and uh, certainly the CTI side can come on a site and look at a particular playground, and playgrounds, by the way, should be broken up into 2 through 5 and 5 through 12. We shouldn't have one size fitting all. 
And sometimes that does happen, that they have a 2 through 12, which is acceptable, but again, that's where supervision comes into play, and uh, parents would have to supervise closely. But it's mostly, I would say, in answer to that question, it's the manufacturer in their catalogs decide what's appropriate, and they try to scale it down appropriately for the anthropometric sizes of the children. Okay, and then a um, second question from Jeffrey. Where can I find a 9-inch slash 12-inch standard for mulch? ASTM? Will they have it? Uh, basically, it's an ASTM uh, derivative uh, standard. It's 1292, but the actual depth, they're not going to get into that. They're just going to talk about the technical uh, attenuation properties. The actual uh, CPSC was the first to put that out, and, and you could go to the CPSC uh, booklet, and uh, they would have it in there. Uh, basically, uh, I'm looking right now on page 10, and... Uh, uh, Point number seven, never use less than nine inches of loose filled material. So it's right in the CPSC. So CPSC, you download that on the previous slide. Uh, go to their site, the uh, www.cpsc.gov. You could download that uh, particular manual. Thank you, Tom. Uh, we have a question here from Gregory who asks, is there a standard as to what park-type structures can be in close proximity to a playground? For example, a statue that is a tripping hazard near a ball field or a tree fence six inches high near playground equipment? These yes, structures are dangerous to children at play. How close are they permitted to be to children in traffic? Okay, if I understand the question correctly by the uh, person, uh, there is a standard uh, for what we call use zones and uh, various stationary objects. Generally speaking, stationary objects on a playground you would have to have uh, six feet off any kind of uh, fence or obstruction or any kind of trip hazard or whatever. Uh, so six feet, generally speaking, would be a use zone. If it's a swing or something moving, there's different types of use zones. A uh, rocking stand-up type platform would be a seven-foot use zone. If it's a swing, it would be twice the vertical. So if you have an eight-foot swing, you would have need 16 feet in front and 16 feet to the rear for a use zone. But, yes, there are... Uh, standards for that, and there are distances that you should be off, and certainly the border of the playground, anything to a border should be six feet off the border. So if you have a contained border of mulch that's uh, uh, bordered by six-inch uh, timbers, you should have basically everything six feet in from that uh, timber uh, of your placement of playground equipment. So I hope that makes sense for the person who asked the question. Excellent. Thank you, Tom. I don't see any other questions right now in the, in the queue, so why don't you continue on with your presentation? Okay. We're just going to finish up, and I, I thought I would uh, finish by uh, having some of uh, what I call the baker's dozen. Many times attorneys are, are retained a recreational expert for the very first time, and I thought these baker's dozen rules would be helpful in assisting uh, you in working uh, with uh, an expert and having a good working relationship with your expert. And many times these uh, points perhaps are not thought of. But uh, first point, get your expert involved early in the case, preferably prior to being in suit. Uh, I've done a number of uh, cases for an attorney up in Kingston, New York, about a dozen or so cases for this gentleman, and he gets me involved immediately in the suit. And uh, I will go up there, investigate the case, and sometimes I never hear from him again until it's settled. Uh, but at least he has all his ducks in a row so he knows basically that the playground investigation was taken on early in the case. If you use a private investigator, make sure all photographs are dated. Many times I'll get in my file photographs, but I don't know when they were taken, and that is certainly key in any litigation matter. You have to date your photographs. Uh, use your recreational expert to assist you in discovery. For example, uh, in developing questions or for interrogatories or developing questions for depositions, use that person because they're the person that you can rely on. They're the person who best knows this area and certainly rely on them to get a feel for what they know. Uh, use your recreational expert to assist you in developing theories of liability or theories for defense. Certainly they can assist you in this. Uh, pass along all your deposition transcripts as soon as possible to your expert. Uh, they will appreciate this, and certainly uh, 
if you do that, they are able to get at them and read them and so forth. There's nothing worse than having a case upon you and you only have to read about 15 depositions. Pass all the exhibits pertaining to the depositions along as well. Many times I get a deposition, they're referring to an exhibit, but I don't know what they're referring to because I don't have the exhibit in front of me. So it's key to pass those along. Let your expert know when the opposing counsel will depose him or her. Uh, key. He to know that because in setting up a time schedule with vacations and so forth, and in my situation, I'm back and forth between Florida and Connecticut, and it's nice to know when I'm in the New England area and when I'm in the Florida area. Uh, let your expert know when the trial is scheduled. Give them a feel for that. When scheduling an inspection, permit the expert sufficient time for photos and measurements. Normally, my inspections take three hours of time, and it's very difficult sometimes for an attorney to realize, you know, it takes that long to do an inspection. And they'll think that I'm just trying to ring up a bill. You know, I'm just trying to get rich out there, believe me, folks, doing a, uh, an inspection. I'm just trying to do an adequate job of taking one bite of the apple and doing a very adequate job in the time I'm there. And whether I'm doing a soccer field, a football field, a playground, whatever it might be, it takes three hours of time to get everything measured and taken and with a degree of accuracy. So that's how long it takes. If it takes less than that, in half an hour, you have an expert that's going to come in and say, okay, I'm going to do it in half an hour. Certainly, you've hired the wrong expert because they're not doing a competent job for you. Uh, let their experts, let your experts write their own reports without interfering and in editing from the attorney. You've retained that person. Trust that person. That person has a college education. That person might have a master's degree. That person might have degrees beyond the master's degree. So trust that person that they're able to communicate. They're able to articulate with you. They're able to put their thoughts down. And I know you have concerns that perhaps, you know, they're not going to write the report the way you want it. But trust that person. You have to trust the person that you've hired and retained and not question every little move and uh, ask them to have several drafts, which we all know in their folder can be very, very dangerous. Uh, so trust that person. Uh, experts appreciate payment on time. I hate to chase after my bills when they're 60 days, 90 days overdue. Uh, so pay your experts on time. I had a call today from an attorney. Uh, enjoyed my report. Praised my report, uh, not patting myself on the back, but then he turned around and said, uh, gee, send me another bill. I don't think I have your bill. Would you send me another bill? I gave him the bill on April 11th. He's sending out the bill today. Uh, so I appreciate that. He got my report on time. Now he's paying on time. I do appreciate that. Uh, the expert is the last to know when the case is settled. Uh, if you want to be a friend with your expert and retain him for another case, you know, tell him, you know, the case is settled. You can destroy your file, purge it now, or wait till the court has passed final settlement on it and, you know, destroy it when I get back in touch with you. But let your expert know because space needs and so forth, it's a problem sometimes. And I can't emphasize, emphasize enough, communicate, communicate, communicate. Uh, many times I'm holding on to a case and I don't hear literally from months to sometimes a year on end of where the case is. I don't know if it's still in litigation, they've settled it, what's happening. So communicate with your expert and, and keep them abreast of what you're doing, appraised of what you're doing, and I think that that expert will appreciate that. So those are my little 13 nuggets. If I could pass some things along to you, that would help from my standpoint, my perspective of being an expert. Um, those are my uh, mailing addresses. Uh, I'm in Manchester, I'm in Florida. Right now I'm in Manchester, Connecticut right now. and uh, so uh, it's been a pleasure uh, speaking to you all, you folks, and uh, hopefully you gain something from this presentation. I thank you, Matt. Thank you, Tom, and thank you to everybody who uh, spent time with us today. I'm just going to wrap things up here with a brief conclusion. Um, if you have a case that you'd like to speak with Tom about, uh, please contact us here at 800-523-2319. Uh, we will be sending out a link to the archive recording of this webinar later on this afternoon. We do post all the archive recordings in the Knowledge Center of the TASA website. So just go to www.tasanet.com and click on the Knowledge Center and you'll see a link to all of our webinars. Our next client-focused webinar will be Burns, the Medco Legal Considerations. It'll take place on May 4th, 2010 at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. If you didn't receive an invitation to this webinar and would like to attend, you can always email me at mhide at tasmanet.com. If you have any questions, comments, suggestions on how we can improve these webinars, uh, please feel free to 
contact me at mhyde at passinet.com, and uh, we will, uh, you know, take your comments under advisement and try to make this a better series. Um, so with that, I'm going to end the presentation. If you, again, if you have any follow-up questions for Tom, uh, you can email me at mhyde at passinet.com. I will be sending out a follow-up email with the link and the PowerPoint presentation probably in the next hour or so. So please look uh, for that from me. But you can always email me, like I said, my email's up on the screen. So thank you, Tom, for your time. I was uh, quite evident that you put a lot of time and thought into this presentation. And thank you to our audience who took an hour out of their time to spend with us this afternoon. We look forward to seeing you at future events.